Ah, greetings, fellow travelers. I can see that you are as road weary as I am. Welcome, please come, have a seat, and I will have my servants tend to you as soon as they return from watering my camels. That may take a while, as you know camels, when they finally do drink, are rather thirsty beasts. It's a beautiful night, isn't it? Just look at the stars. Such wonder and such beauty in the heavenly expanse. You know, I used to feel small and insignificant when I would look up at the heavens. Perhaps you felt that way. I no longer feel that way anymore. There are people who look to the stars for, of course, meaning in their lives, to know their future. Those who look for answers to life's questions. Those who just hope to hear the voice of the universe somehow speak to them. I have always believed that the heavens hold secret knowledge for us if we will but understand how to discern what they have to say. Ah, forgive me, where are my manners? Allow me to introduce myself. I am Melchior of Baghdad, 17th prince to the throne of Parthia, to the heirs to the great throne of Cyrus, Alexander, and Antiochus. I am a servant of El El Yon, the Most High God, and a master of the heavens, advisor to Asarces, my own king, the 23rd king of Parthia. Welcome again, dear friends. I am also a member of a sacred order called the Magi. We are scholars from Persia. We've been called many other things. Some have referred to us as sorcerers or conjurers, wizards, astrologers, among other less flattering titles. Some of us seek to understand the properties or powers of precious metals. Some of us look to the ancient texts of different cultures for meaning and answers. Some of us are watchers of the heavens. But all of us are seekers of truth. And perhaps it's because of our lifelong quest for truth that we have sometimes been called wise men. I've spent my life seeking truth. It's a quest that has taken me to many places, far and near, on many journeys. Some of these journeys have been wondrous beyond words. Some have been quite dangerous. All have shaped me in some way. But there is one journey that stands out above all others. One journey that shaped my life and changed me forever. You see, I no longer travel now in search of the truth. Now I travel to proclaim it. If you will allow me, friends, I'd like to tell you about that journey so many years ago. As I said, I come from Persia part of the great Parthian Empire, heirs to the ancient Babylon and Greek empires. Perhaps you've heard of Cyrus, Darius, or Alexander the Great. My people are descendants of those great empires. King Cyrus conquered Assyria 600 years before I was born. The Assyrian kings had conquered the Judean people, the Jews, several centuries before I was born, and brought them to live in my homeland near Baghdad. You may have read about this captivity and exile in the books you call Kings and Chronicles. But King Cyrus and Darius were more lenient than their uh, Assyrian predecessors, and they allowed the Jewish people who had lived so long in captivity to return to their homeland and to even rebuild their temple. However, some of the Jewish holy men stayed behind in my homeland, and many of their writings or copies of the writings stayed behind as well. In fact, some of my ancestors even studied under a, an advisor in the Babylonian court by the name of Daniel. Perhaps you know him. So thus, we have always known something about the religion and the writings and the prophecies of the Jewish people. It was Balthazar, my friend and fellow Magi, who first found the words recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures of an ancient seer named Balaam, who lived many centuries before and he wrote this, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. Thus we concluded that the appearance of a great star would mark the arrival of a great king, king of the Jews. Another of their prophets had written, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
it's probably not hard for you to see how this excited us so much. And these prophecies prompted my friends and I to begin to study and watch intently for the appearance of a new star. It was another of our order, Gaspar, who first observed that there seemed to be coming a convergence of two planets that had not happened for 3,000 years. The planet the Romans called Jupiter, the father planet, and Venus, the mother planet, were on a course to intersect so they would appear as one in the sky. When I asked Gaspar how many months it would be, he looked at me with wide eyes and said, oh no, not months, only a few weeks. We watch the movements of the heavens every night to see if our calculations were correct. Then one night, the most wonderful and the most unusual and amazing thing happened. Venus and Jupiter were almost touching, very close in the sky now, and they were directly in line with one another, pointing westward. And as if you followed your eye along the line that they made, there was a new star. We checked our charts. None of us could name this star. None of us had seen this star in that position or any other position before. It was a star of such brilliance and beauty, it, it's beyond my power to describe it to you. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. And I had watched the skies every night for 20 years. We named this star Saru. It's the Babylonian word for king. The king star, you see. Do you understand? Mother and father lined up pointing directly to the new king who was to be born. Each night after that, it seemed to us that this star, Saru, grew both in brilliance uh, and in beauty and in power, certainly power over us. We had a very clear suspicion that something momentous was happening in human history, something that had never happened before. And I had this growing sense in my spirit that we were being summoned, that this star was calling us to follow. I know this may sound crazy to you, how can you follow a star? But this star was unlike any other star. It did not move across the heavens each night. It hung in one place. Its shining was almost like a pulsing, like a beacon, calling to us, drawing us. Some of my colleagues laughed and scoffed at such a ridiculous notion, such superstition. But I knew that no matter the cost, no matter the risk, I had to follow I had to go. I must see this new king. I petitioned my own king, Asarces. I asked him for permission to go. Not only did he grant me his permission, he actually funded the trip himself. But it took a little more convincing to get some of my order to follow with me. They were much less willing to leave the comfort of their, their homes, their families. It was going to cost a lot. And we, it was great risk. In the end, our, our caravan consisted of only two other fellow magi, the two I've already mentioned to you, Gaspar and Balthazar, and enough servants and camels to carry our belongings and our food and provisions, tend to our needs, and provide for our security on the journey. Gaspar was the youngest by far, and he was from Arabia, but he'd been in our court since he was just a young boy. And Balthazar was the oldest, certainly, well advanced in years and nearly blind. I fear that he was too old to make the journey. But no one can talk Gaspar out of anything once he's made up his mind to go. The journey was very long and not always comfortable or pleasant. Nearly 800 miles, it took us all of six months to travel. The heat of the day was matched by the chill at night, but each night was refreshing to our souls because every night as we made camp, we beheld again the brilliance of the star of the king. And each day we journeyed, anxious to see what would be at the end of our journey. But after many, many weeks of travel, we finally arrived in the holy city, the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. Do you know the name Jerusalem? In Hebrew, it's Jeru Shalayim. City of peace. But if you know something of its history, it has not always been a peaceful city. 
but it was the holy city, the capital of Israel. Where else would we go to look for a newborn king than the capital city of Israel? Now we knew that the real ruler of the province was the Roman governor. Nevertheless, we made our way to the Jewish king, the Hebrew king, a man named Herod. After all, who would know about his successor more than the current present king of the Jews? It was not at all unusual for travelers to stop in the holy city, but we were unique in every way. Strangers in both appearance and language, obviously wealthy, but we carried nothing to sell or to trade, only gifts for this king. I think it was our odd appearance that gained us an audience quickly with King Herod. After offering the customary courtesies in his court, we asked our question, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We have seen his star, and we have come to worship him. At this announcement, at our question, Herod's demeanor seemed to change, but in the moment I could not tell if he was troubled or just thoughtful. But there was a murmuring among his court. Either way, he called the chief priests and the teachers of the law together to ask this question, and the answer came quickly. The answer is Bethlehem, they said, a town I had never heard of before. For this is what the prophet Micah has written. And they quoted to me a Hebrew prophet I had never heard. Micah has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the people of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We were so excited and so close, we were ready to make our exit when Herod asked for a private audience, calling us back in to his inner chamber. He pressed us with many questions. His gaze made me uneasy. He wanted to know exactly what time the star had appeared and how long exactly our journey had taken. And when the time came, he gave us instructions to head on to Bethlehem to worship the child, and then to return to him so that he too might go and pay homage to his successor. Now in the moment, I thought there was something less than sincere about Herod's request. But I would not understand all of that until the Most High would reveal to all three of us in a dream not to return to Herod. You see, what we learned later was that Herod was not a king by birth, as other kings are, but he gained his authority and his throne from the Roman Senate. And therefore he viewed everyone with suspicion out of fear someone would someday usurp his power and unseat him from the throne. And here we had come announcing the birth of a rival. In fact, we had been warned to be careful when we met him and inquired about this new king. Herod had already killed two of his sons and one of his wives to keep his throne. There was a saying in Jerusalem in those days, it is better to be Herod's dog than Herod's son. It was getting late when we left the palace. And our inclination was to stay the night in, Jer in Jerusalem and make the journey, the short journey, the next morning in Bethlehem. We could be there by sunup. But it was only six miles away. We were so close. After so many hundreds of miles, so many nights sleeping out in the open, we were almost at our journey's end. We could not contain our excitement. The anticipation was too much. There would be no sleep anyway. And so we pressed on to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a village of less than a thousand souls, not six miles from the holy city. Compared to the hundreds of miles we had traveled, this was nothing. So we made our way to this little village. And as we drew nearer, the most incredible thing happened. I don't know if I can explain this to you, but as we drew near to Bethlehem, the star seemed to draw near to us. I mean, it seemed to grow in its brilliance, in its brightness, and in its closeness to us. Of course, I've studied too long to suggest that it actually did so in truth. Only that as we drew near the city, it drew near to us. But then when we came to the outskirts of this little town, something just was not right to my eyes. I mean, there was nothing there. There was no fanfare, there was no city gate, there was, the place was deserted. It was empty, a very humble and poor town. No one was speaking. There were no one, no one in the street. There was no signs of royalty, no signs that anything unusual had happened. I thought, this cannot possibly be the place. Have we been misinformed? Could Herod's own scholars be wrong? As we prepared our camp outside of town, 
thinking we would explore in the morning, I heard a commotion of voices talking excitedly just inside the city gate. Naturally curious, I went to investigate. There in the street was a small group of villagers talking amongst themselves, but I could not understand them. It was a dialect I didn't know. They seemed very excited about something, but being at a loss to understand them, I turned to leave them when I heard a word, a word that I recognized. It was the word Messiah. Messiah. That was the word the Hebrew prophets had used to describe their king. Messiah. I was so excited. I ran back into their midst and tried to look, get them to understand me. I must have looked like a madman, waving my arms and trying to find out which one had said Messiah. I just kept shouting, Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. They stared at me, shaking their heads, until one of them, finally, in my limited Aramaic, was able to understand what I was asking. And if I understood him correctly, he told me that not a few months ago, some sort of messenger spirit had appeared out in the countryside, right near Bethlehem, and announced the arrival of this Messiah, this king. I was so excited, I could hardly get the words out. I ran to my companions and said, He is here! We found the place! We gathered our things and asked one of them, a small boy, to lead us to the place where the king had been born. But do you know where he led us? You'll never guess. He led us to a humble home, a very poor home. Not just the home, but to the back half of the home. You know, the place where you put your domesticated animals. Not much more than a stable. It was deserted. I thought there must be some mistake. I asked him again, we, no, no, we want to know where the birthplace of your king is. He pointed and nodded excitedly, saying to us, this is the place. How could this be a king? How could a king be born in this place? With impatience, and I, was, I could hardly contain myself, I said, well, where is he now? The boy looked at us excitedly and said, a room has become available in another part of the city. All but grabbing him, I made him show us. He led us to another humble home, not much larger than the first. I, I was certain something was wrong. We'd found the wrong place. This could not be the king we were looking for. I mean, friends, there was no sign at all of royalty, no security, no servants, just a humble little home. Despite my hesitation and confusion, I entered the home. Right inside the door was seated a young man. He opened his arms in welcome and motioned for us to follow. As he did so, I noticed his hands. They were the hands of a working man, strong and rough, like the hands of a stone mason or a builder, perhaps a carpenter. He fought, we followed him into an inner chamber, and there on a small bench was seated nothing but a girl, certainly younger than my youngest daughter, and on her lap, a small child. How could this be a king? She turned and smiled at me, I fumbled for words. I said, is this, is he? She looked at me with beaming eyes and said, his name is Yeshua. Yeshua. At that name, I began to tremble. My knees buckled. I did not know why. And I fell on my knees before this child. And I began to weep uncontrollably. Gaspar was so confused. He just stared at me. And stared about the shower, just blinking, not understanding any of this. Again, no signs of royalty. No, he didn't even think that his own, this child's own people knew that he was a king. There was nothing at all to suggest such a thing in this house. But something was happening in my heart. I don't know how long I remained there, but eventually I opened my eyes and I looked up. The girl, the child's mother, was still smiling. I rose from my knees and I reached out to touch the child and look into his face. And in that moment, I felt this overwhelming sense of unworthiness flooding into my soul. I did not understand it at the time. Every wicked thing I'd ever said or done came racing back into my mind. Every sin I'd committed, every lie I'd told, all of the shame and regret of my life overwhelmed me. And again, I wept. I wept in sorrow and shame until suddenly my tears turned to joy. Tell me you haven't cried so hard you started laughing. 
That's what happened to me. I didn't understand it. Many, many years later, I would understand what was happening to me that night. Then suddenly I remembered that we had brought gifts for this king. I had brought frankincense. It's an incense that both Hebrews and Persians burn as an offering to their gods. And I had hoped that I would offer it to this child or to his parents, that they might burn it as a thank offering to their God. But I tell you, as I offered it to him, I felt the strangest urge to burn it all as an offering to him right then and there. Gaspar slowly approached and timidly set down his gift of gold. Looking around, he finally did what we all did, which is to bow before this child. But I wish you could have seen Balthazar. His is the most wonderful story. Old Balthazar, with half-blind eyes, he began to dance at his age, lifting up his robes, dancing and singing songs that he learned from the Hebrew holy men in our country. Tears filled his eyes, and when his dance was done, he too fell on his knees and bowed his head before this child. When he rose, he offered his gift. It was a gift of myrrh. Perhaps you don't know what myrrh is. Myrrh is a very precious and sacred spice, oil, if you will. It's used to anoint holy places and to embalm the bodies of the dead. He offered it to the mother, who looked a little confused. I mean, admittedly, an embalming spice is a strange gift to be given for your child. I assured her it was of the richest quality. And again, many years later, we would understand the significance of this gift. I stayed there for what seemed like only moments, but it must have been hours, for there was daylight when we left that little house. My friends, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you knew God spoke to you? Where you felt touched by him in some way? A moment in your life where you knew you would never be the same from this moment. This was my moment. God spoke to me that night in that little town, so many miles from home. I don't know why he chose me to spoke to, speak to or what he saw in me, but he spoke to me, and it changed me forever. You know, he still speaks. He's speaking to you too. I believe that with all my heart, if we will but cease our striving and listen to what he has to say. Since that day, Balthazar and I have devoted our whole lives to the study of the Hebrew Scriptures. Our whole lives in worship to the child king we saw that night. But you know, Gaspar never really accepted that child as king. At least not as his king. Oh, he talked often and fondly about our great journey together. He talked often about the wondrous star we had seen. But it never penetrated his heart the way it had mine or Balthazar's. I wondered about that over the years. We both had the same experience. How could it transform me and he be so cold to it? But I suppose even a wise man can have his flaws. Over the years, we would listen eagerly to every bit of news we got from that region of the world, from Judea, always expecting that we would someday eventually hear that this child had grown and taken his throne. But we never heard that news. Do you know what we heard? Little bits and rumors, stories about a man who taught people to love and to forgive, a man who healed the lame, and made the blind see. Years later, we would hear another story about how that same man died on a Roman cross and that somehow his death had opened the doors for all people of all races, cultures, and empires and nations to be forgiven by God. It was then I would understand both my tears of sorrow and joy that night. It was then I would understand the power of Balthazar's gift of myrrh. You see, he came to give his life for us. I came bringing only a token. I traveled 800 miles. He traveled an eternal distance. 
As one of your own wise men has written in a song, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. In my home country, to this day, I am revered as a wise man. People seek me out for answers, seeking the truth. But friends, I have seen the truth. I have looked into the face of truth. People would come to me for answers, and I used to consult the stars to give them what they needed. I no longer look to the stars for answers, friends. Because I have met the one who put them there in the first place. I have seen the maker of heaven and earth. What about you, dear friend? What about you? Where are you traveling to? What are you in search of in this life? Wherever your journey takes you, however long it lasts, whatever you experience along the way, you will not find that which you seek in the stars alone. You will not find it in the wealth of this world. I have had both. Might I humbly suggest to you that what your heart longs for, what your life is searching for, is right in front of you if you will but bow down and worship him.